being recorded and oops, let me, can you, let me, oh, I think I should, can you see the, the full screen view, the slides, uh, slideshow view? Okay. Well, hello everyone. Thank you for being here, especially Jane on her birthday. Um, I appreciate that. Uh, my name's Susan Gracia and I, you know, very pleased to be spending a couple of hours with you. The topic for today is assessment for learning, and I'll explain why I'm emphasizing the for learning um, for adult educators. And um, I thank you, Je Joan, for the invitation. As Joan said, we've known each other for a long time. We actually um, met in 1990 and worked together for a number of years. And since then, our, our paths you know, have crossed, or sometimes we're working in the same place at the same time. Sometimes one of us is doing work with or for the, each other. So um, it's really a pleasure to be with Joan and to be with all of you today. Um, and just you know, to kind of let you know who I am, um, and, you know, I live in Providence. I've been there for 25 years, which I can hardly believe. And I've been in Rhode Island most of my life. Um, I taught ESOL for a long time. I started out as a French teacher and then um, transitioned to English to speakers of other language. But I've also taught adult basic education. I taught GED, did some workplace education. And I um, did that in New York City and Boston and Rhode Island. I taught English in France and England as well. And I taught in Peru. Um, about eight years ago, I lived there for six months. Um, I was actually teaching in a school of education there, uh, teaching assessment courses. And I am a former faculty member and director of, oh, director of assessment at the Feinstein School of Education and Human Development at Rhode Island College. I was there for a number of years, but now I'm at um, Northeastern where I'm teaching data analytics and data literacy and assessment and, and things like that. And still doing a lot of work consulting, you know, so I get opportunities to do things like I'm doing with you today. Um, so that's a little bit about me and what kind of brings me to this point. And I would love to know who's here. Um, you know, we have a small enough group that I think we could just go around and have people introduce each other. I think you may well, Joan, it seems like you know everyone. I don't know if you all know each other as well. So if I'm the only one who doesn't know you, I'm sorry. <laughs> but I'm um, just wondering if you could tell me what your name is, where you teach, if you are teaching now, what you teach, if you're um, teaching. And then, you know, if there's anything else that you would like to share, that would be absolutely fine. Um, so does anybody want to start? I'll start. My name is Carrie. I'm from West Bay Community Action, um, and I teach GED prep. I also work for um, Pawtucket Adult Ed, and I teach ESL there. Okay. Thank you. Nice to meet you, Carrie. Nice to meet you, too. Thank you. My name is Donna. I work with Carrie at West Bay, and um, we teach GED and soft skills, and yeah. Okay. <laughs> and workforce development. Yes, workforce development, this is all true. Okay, great, nice to meet you too. Donna, I feel like I just left you 10 minutes ago, but this yes, is- you did. <laughs> we survived I, the ride meeting earlier today. Right, yeah. <laughs> um, I teach at the Community College of Rhode Island and I teach in our Bridge GED program and also our Rye Best um, CNC manufacturing program. Okay, thank you, Jane. And happy birthday again. Thank you. <laughs> I'm Ann Gerald, and I teach at Dorcas International Institute of Rhode Island, and uh, I teach low intermediate ESL. Thank you, Ann. Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you. Hi, I'm Beatrice McGeeck. I am not regularly teaching, but I have a lot of experience with GED, and I'm the director at CCRI, where we have the Bridge Program and the RIBES programs. Thank you. Nice to meet you, too. Nice to meet you. Couple of other people. I can go. Uh, my name is Sabine. I'm a program administrator, but I am teaching right now um, at the Institute for Labor Studies and Research, and I'm teaching ESL Level One. Thank you. Nice to meet you. Nice to I'm meet you. Janet. I teach ESOL through CCRI and through the Providence Public Library, and I'm also working in a um, pre-employment program with the Providence Housing Authority. Great. 
Well, you're all very busy, as I can see. Um, I remember, you know, when I was teaching ESOL and workplace education, working in different places, and I see that some of you are, uh, you know, going back and forth to different centers and different programs as well. So um, I really hope, I appreciate you taking the time today to be with us, and I hope that you'll find um, what we're going to be talking about useful. And as you know, um, we're, we're going to be talking about assessment today. Oh, we've got somebody else coming in. And um, I thought just kind of in terms of getting to know you and getting starting to, you know, think about assessment, we're all assessors as, as instructors. Um, I thought I'd start out by asking you, you know, on a scale of one being low and five to high, how would you rate your current assessment knowledge and skills? And I don't know if you've used slido.com before, but um, it's the, the program I use sometimes for, you know, doing kind of questions and discussions when I'm teaching online. But you can either take a picture of, or, you know, aim your camera at the QR code, just like you do nowadays in restaurants, and it'll take you right to slido.com. Or if you go to slido.com and put in the code 366-367, it'll bring you to this question. And so asking, good, I see at least one person's already on. Um, but just to kind of see where you place yourself. Where is it? These days. I hear an echo. I don't know if that's an me. echo. <laughs> okay, I see two people. And this is completely anonymous, but it it's helpful just to kind of see where, where people um, are when we begin our, a meeting like this. Got three, four of you. I'll give you a couple more minutes. I'm sorry. anybody having any trouble like yeah to the I tried to do it OCR and now I'm gonna try to do it Slido oh, oh all right okay give you a couple more minutes how many people five people have responded I'm sorry I'm responding right to what one scale of what your current assessment knowledge and skills who, uh, who was asking? I that? apologize, but how are how am I responding on here? You would choose one, two, three, four, five. No, I know, but how do I choose? I, I'm not being able to. What am I? How do I? And the view? Let's see. Where, how come my in, oh annotate annotate? Let me see. You have uh, to go to the website. Yeah, go to slido.com. Yeah, slido oh, okay. I have to actually go to this website. I'm sorry, right. I tuned in a little late. I am yeah. so sorry. Oh, man. all right. Yeah, or you could um, aim your camera at the QR code. Gotcha. Okay, Thank and, you. Then, and then if you do the code 366-367, that will bring you to this three, question. Three, six, and then um, you can thank you much. make your choice. Yeah. Six, seven. Sorry. <laughs> Sorry if I didn't explain. Yeah. All right, so we've got six, six responses so far. And so I see that just in the, you know, this little group, we have kind of the, a range, people have a range of comfort levels um, right now with assessment. That might have been another good question to ask you, you know, how comfortable or confident do you feel in your assessment work right now? And see that we've got kind of an equal spread between two and four with it looks like um, two people, you know, two people at a, a two, two and a three, two and a four somebody who feels you know, with a high level of uh, skill in, and knowledge and assessment. Um, and we're, okay, so the majority of you, at least at this point, are at a three, kind of right in the middle. Um, so I would like to draw on the experience and the knowledge of the people who already feel pretty strong in assessment. I'll be asking you for some of your input and um, experience as we go through um, our activities today. And for people who right now are, you know, feeling or would rate themselves a little bit lower on the scale, I hope that today will be useful. And I hope so as well for the people who feel pretty strong. I, um, but it's good to know kind of where you are. And we kind of have a, a bell curve of people, um, which is kind of typical where we've got some feeling a little lower, most people feeling kind of in the middle, and then others feeling, um, you know, pretty strong. 
And given, you know, what you, your assessment experience, your assessment knowledge, and your decision to attend today, I'm really curious about what your expectations are for today. You know, what do you hope to get out of it? And, um, you know, it, the question can be answered really using the same methodology with the slido.com and the code. And here you can just type in your response. Um, and I'll give you a minute or so to do that. Ah. And a minute to think about it as well. Thank you for the person who already has answered. Okay, so you know, someone said they'd like to review some basics and get clear on essential practices. Um, to incorporate into your program, and I hope that you can incorporate this into, right into what you're doing. Um, someone said they're curious to see how we already understand it, and um, hoping that the workshop addresses the way assessment that happens is used and plays out. Understand how to use student assessments to increase student learning. Okay. Anybody else? Gain skills, be able to do more diverse types of assessment, review best practices, um, maybe think about how assessment works in your classroom. At Dorcas, interesting, you're working on a universal assessment tool and you've been reading a lot about assessment, learn more techniques, okay? Seven, uh, authentic assessment versus standard assessments. I think we're gonna be talking more about authentic kind of classroom assessments, well, pretty much entirely today, um, as opposed to like standardized assessments. But that's good to, to kind of know what brought you here and what you expected. And I will share for you the, the learning targets or, that I had kind of created today's session about, and we can certainly go in some other directions to um, accommodate some of your interests or questions. Um, but in terms of um, targets for today, you know, what I'm hoping that you will be able to do by the time you leave today, and keep in mind too that this is a two-part um, workshop because we have next week as well, um, but that you'll be able to identify the importance and impact of assessment for teachers and learners, um, to, that you'll be able to differentiate between assessment of learning and assessment for learning. Um, remember the title of the workshop is assessment for learning. So we'll really be focused on that. We'll be talking about the, the keys, you know, kind of best practice for a quality classroom assessment. Um, we will be spending a lot of time today um, talking about learning outcomes, or I like to call them learning targets because they are really one of the foundations for designing um, and implementing good um, assessments and especially kind of unpacking them so that we really understand what the, the learning outcomes entail so that we can use them for teaching and learning and assessment. And in terms of the agenda, you know, right now we're, um, you know, we're in the part of the agenda where we're talk, focusing on introductions and expectations. We'll spend a little time talking about what assessment is, which you know, but I want to, there are so many different there are different ways of, of conceptualizing assessment, and I want to be clear about what we're talking about. Um, again, we'll be talking about the, the keys, kind of best practices to quality assessments, learning targets, and really deconstructing them um, so that we're clear about what we're assessing. And it really helps for teaching as well. And then we'll wrap up. Um, any questions at this point? Okay, all right. So, I mean, you all signed up for a workshop and assessment. So um, I, I assuming that you're interested in assessment and you certainly um, use assessment a lot, but you know, one of the reasons why assessment is important for us to focus on and to talk about is that it's such a critical part of our work as teachers. 
And you know, there have been a number of studies that show that a large proportion of our time is spent on assessment or assessment related activities. Um, so you know, one you'll you'll come across or I've come across different estimates that a conservative estimate is that teachers spend about 25% of their time on assessment. Um, there's a really uh, well-known assessment study by Black and William in 1998 that a lot of current assessment thought and practice is built on. And as far back as then, um, a meta-analysis you know, revealed that teachers spend about a third of their time on assessment-related activities, whether that's designing assessments, grading and correcting, giving feedback to students, using assessment information to plan. Um, assessment is, plays a really, really key role in teacher work. So it's, you know, it's really an important thing for us to think about and to focus on. And so, you know, I've used the, the word assessment probably dozens of times already um, in this session. Um, so I'd like to ask you, you know, what is assessment to you? How would you define it or describe it? Um, and again, I'm using Slido. It's the same code. And I'll give you just a couple minutes to, there's no, no right or wrong, but to define assessment as, as you understand it. And I think that'll be a good point of departure for us. you so far. It shows up here that six people have responded, but I only see three um, answers. Is that the same thing that you view from your screen? Mine was there and then it disappeared. So I, I don't see, know. Uh, yeah, I see three. Yeah, me too. It's strange. Mine only shows two on my screen, but I see three on the um, on okay. your screen. That is, I've never yeah, seen the first that. first three disappeared because they said different things. Yeah. All right. Okay. I see four now. Yeah. Huh. So some of you have answered. So, um, you know, some of the themes that I can see is to see what students know or what they can do. Um, there's another comment that at least is visible to me about collecting and analyzing student work for the purpose of increasing student learning, um, gauging or measuring how something is working, um, how well it's achieving its intended goal. Okay, now I can see um, a couple other responses, a way of finding out what learners know, a process for learners to demonstrate their knowledge and skills. I see a, a weather. I don't know if somebody's response is cut off. Would anybody want to... Um, add to that or um yeah i think that's mine if uh -huh. i typed in that it's you know an opportunity to see where a student is with a particular skill set and or whether or not however i worded it whether or not they had a particular skill set or particular knowledge but the whole thing didn't print out i don't know yeah, yeah so sorry about that i mean I, I i've never had that happen so i don't know Slido is having a little bit of problems today, but thank you for um, clarifying that. Is there anybody else who whose response doesn't show or that I didn't kind of um, mention when I was trying to sum up? I'm not yeah. sure if I yeah. said something about um, it's an ongoing process of active observation and la la la. I don't know if you saw that. Or I didn't see it anything worded exactly like that. So thanks, Janet. Yeah. Um, and I like how you said an ongoing process. Um, and you, you mentioned, you know, sometimes when people think of assessment, they think of tests or, you know, grading and you mentioned observation and, and what else? Something else? Um, just sort of how you see day in and day out. And this is not what I wrote, no, I'm just. Okay, all right, yeah, well, thank you. Work, but 
yeah, just that it's it's sort of a feedback loop and it, it's right. about experience and challenges. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and thank you very much to everybody. And I'm sorry for any technical difficulties, but um, you see, you know, different themes here, you know, finding out what or how much people know, students know, maybe at a particular time. Um, it also described as an ongoing process, continuous, you know, a feedback loop. Um, some people mentioned, you know, finding uh, it's a way to find out if something's working, you know, maybe our instruction or our, our teaching. Um, so we've got a, you know, variety of, of kind of nuances about um, what assessment is. And I think, you know, what, what you have shown is, is really typical where there are many, many kind of aspects or angles about assessment. And, you know, here it says, you know, if you ask five teachers, you probably get five different answers. And, you know, it could be the end of unit test. It's the grades I give, it's testing, it's what helps me understand what students know or have learned. Some people say, you know, it's good teaching. So if you're, you're a good teacher, you're also a good assessor. You know, there are a lot of different ways of looking assessment. And something that I always find, I find useful for um, thinking of assessment and, and for where we're going in terms of assessment of and for learning is that, you know, the most common, um, definition of assessment, you know, according to the dictionary is um, judging, you know, or deciding the, the amount or the quality or the value or the importance of something. And that is the way assessment is used a lot in kind of day-to-day -day language or certainly, you know, often in policy or in the, in the public. Um, and that's, you know, how much do students know? What do they know? Have they learned what they're, they're supposed to? And it's kind of an act of judgment. And, but I find it really interesting that in English, you know, the origin of the word assess comes from the Latin, which means to sit beside or, you know, to kind of to sit next to. And so in English, we also have that idea of assessment as kind of sitting next to the student, with, being with the student, observing the student, guiding the student. And that's kind of the other side of assessment. We've got the judgments maybe that happen, you know, periodically or at the end of instruction. And we also, we also see the student and we, we are with him or her every day and, and we assess in that way. And so, I, you know, I'm sure that you're all familiar with this. Yeah, I like to call this the two faces of assessment. And this is where we're getting into kind of some of the, the focus of today. Um, that we have assessment of learning, which is summative, and you can call it summative assessment as well. It's often at the end, the end of something, the end of the week, the end of a unit, the end of a course, the end of something. It's used to judge, you know, has the person, has the student gotten it? Have, do they pass? Can they go to the next level? It often is used to re reveal uh, deficiencies or maybe um, act as a, a gate, you know, uh, kind of a gatekeeper before going, before going to the next level. And it's performed by the teacher or maybe in the case of like standardized testing by the state or by someone outside of the, the student, him or herself. And then in contrast, we have assessment for learning, which is continuous, like I think Janet was talking about. Um, often we call it formative assessment, or but I like to call it formative assessment plus, and I'll explain it in a minute. Um, it's used to improve. Um, it's used to improve our own practice and to improve student learning while instruction is taking place. We, it, it, the intention is for us to provide feedback to the student rather than use to judge or make a judgment about quality. And I think the important thing about assessment for learning is that it's. It's performed or done by teachers, but also by learners, students themselves and, and their peers. And for me, that's the, di the difference between the typical way people talk about formative assessment and assessment for learning um, is that the student him or herself is involved in assessment for learning. And then of course, both types of assessment use criteria. We have to have criteria to, to know, to actually use the assessment. They both use assessment instruments. We, they are driven by evidence. We gather evidence in, in both cases, but um, these are the you know the two faces of assessment that that we work with and um, have to deal with on a daily basis. And just to recap, you know the 
I bet a lot of you use the term summative assessment. Um, that is the same as assessment of learning, making a judgment. We can use some summative assessments formatively, um, like for helping students to set goals or for us to set goals for next stages in instruction, um, for students to, to look at their summative assessment results and assess themselves. But often summative assessments are given at the end of some learning experience and um, there isn't always the opportunity to use those results to, to improve. And on the other hand, assessment for learning, which I call formative assessment plus, um, is a process, it's continuous, it's used by teachers and students, it takes place during instruction, it provides feedback to teachers and students, but of course the feedback helps us realize what's working in the classroom, as somebody said just a couple of minutes ago, but also it gives feedback to students on where they need to work or what they need, where they can go next. Um, and it helps teachers and students make adjustments that will improve student achievement. We can make our own adjustments in our instruction. Students can make in, in, um, adjustments in how they're tackling a certain, um, a certain you know, topic or skill. And it's really, it centers on three student um, level questions. You know, where am I going? Where am I now? And where to next? And that's so assessment for learning is really from more than anything from the point of the student. So the, uh, the student understands the expectations, the targets, um, the things that he or she's supposed to learn, that the feedback can be used for the student to understand where he or she stands, you know, what are they doing well, what do they need to work on, and identify next steps. And I think it's it's interesting that there's a lot of research that um, that supports the fact that formative or class assessment for learning does well, done well, has some really important um, impacts. That there are some studies that looked at assessment for learning implemented in the classroom and the gains in student learning when teachers used assessment for learning practices were among the largest of any other educational intervention, you know, new curriculum, new approaches to teaching, um, things like that. There's a lot of research that shows that using assessment for learning, it really increases um, student motivation. And it is something, assessment in general, but particularly assessment for learning has traditionally been lacking in teacher preparation. It's um, I never, I was not trained in assessment when I learned to teach. And it, at least nominally, is a part of teacher education programs today, but it's something that, in my experience, teacher education programs have been struggling to really incorporate or incorporate well. And so, you know, in terms of assessment for learning, um, we really organize it around um, five key keys to quality classroom assessment are five kinds of practices that are essential to for assessment for learning to, to be done well. And um, three of them focus on being sure that our assessment is accurate. And then a couple of them really focus on us using assessment and assessment results effectively. And we're gonna be focusing on keys one and two today and some on on uh, key five. Um, next week, we'll really be focusing on sound design, the design of assessments. But the first you know, key is we have to be clear about the purpose of the assessment. And that's where the assessment for learning, the assessment of learning is important. We need to know what is the purpose of the assessment? Is it to judge a student's you know, value or achievement? Is it to be used for continuous improvement? Need to think of who will use the results and what will they do with them. The second key is clear targets. You know, we need students need and we need clear learning targets. What is it that we expect um, students to know and be able to do? Are those targets clear? Are they good? Are they worthwhile? Um, the design of the assessment has to be appropriate. And one of the reasons we focus a lot on clear targets is because the method of assessment depends on what your, your target is. 
there are certain um, kind of learning outcomes you, we have for students that, for example, a writing, you know, a, an essay would be a completely inappropriate method of assessment. So we have to match the targets and the methods. Um, and then, you know, of, in assessment for learning, we have to be um, really focused on communicating the results, um, managing the information, reporting it to students, to, our, to ourselves. And really important is students being involved, that assessment isn't something that's done to them, but something that they are involved in if they know the purpose of the assessment, if they're aware of the targets, um, if um, the methodology is correct, if they receive good feedback, and if they participate in assessment, self-assessment, assessing their peers, um, tracking their own progress, things like that. And so I, you know, I, the second key is that our learning targets need to be clear. And I like to use the word target because I feel like there's so many other terms people use um, and sometimes argue about when we are talking about statements of intended learning or what we want students to know or be able to do, you know, at the end of a lesson, at the end of a course or whatever the learning experience might be. And so, you know, when I say learning target, other people might call, and I sometimes call them learning outcomes. Mm -hmm. um, sometimes people call them learning objectives, student learning outcomes or SLOs, learning goals, benchmarks, learning intentions, competencies. There are a lot of terms that people use. Um, but just to try and be consistent, I, I use learning targets. And sometimes I have found there can be... Um, disagreements, especially about the term learning objective, where um, sometimes people say a learning objective is what we want students to know and be able to do. Sometimes people say a learning objective is what the teacher wants to do. And rather than kind of argue or disagree about that, I think learning target is a little bit um, neutral. And so um, I've been talking for a good amount of time, right, um, in the last few minutes. So I'll ask you, um, if you think of, you know, learning targets and maybe you call them learning outcomes, you know, what you want your students to know or be able to do in a particular class session or in a course that you're teaching, what are the benefits of those, uh, of clear targets for teachers, in your opinion? And you don't have to write this, you can just, you can just speak. Just to make sure everybody's on the same page, not even just the teachers, but the learners as well. Mm -hmm. make sure everybody understands what we're trying, why they're there. The, you know, it's the why behind it. You know, we'll get to the how, but here's the why. Yeah. 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 I don't know about you, but how many, uh, I have, you know, three kids who are, who are not totally grown, but they're older now, but sometimes, you know, I'd be saying to people, well, or see it saying to them, well, what are you doing? You know, what are you learning in this earth that class? They're like, I have no idea. <laughs> we don't want our own students to be saying that. Yeah. Any, who, anyone else? Mm -hmm. Anne, are you speaking? I, I, oh, I'm sorry, no. Muted. I could see your, look. oh, you weren't? Oh, no. Oh, okay, all right, sorry about that. Well, I, I have something for teachers. Uh, teachers, before they, uh, put their targets, to me, I believe teachers need to know what their learners need to learn, okay? Mm -hmm. Then they make their targets accordingly. Mm -hmm. okay? Yeah, no, I think that's a very good point. Well, when, when, when they do that, then they can go through their goals and, uh, but they have to make sure their learners are aware of what they are going to learn. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. Aware of these targets because both, you know, the, the, the learners will be following their teachers towards these targets and achieving them. Mm -hmm. And, you know, targets are kind of needs to be built, built up, you know, one at a time, you know. So I cannot reach my final target without going to the targets before target or targets before it, mm -hmm. yeah. and that's that's why 
you know, assessment or formative assessment, I would say, rather than the summative assessment would be most effective. Mm -hmm. I agree with everything you said, you know, um, we need to know where our students are and what they need and want to know, because if, if, if they're not appropriate for the students, those targets are no good. Um, like you said, students need to know, be aware of what they're learning. Um, I also liked what you said about you may have a final target, but there are many targets that lead up to it as well. Um, so thank you very much. Who else? We can talk about benefits to either teachers or students or both. And I can't see everyone right now. I, don't I, want to... um, I was going to say that it makes learning less overwhelming when, when it's specific. There's like a specific thing you're focused on. Otherwise, mm -hmm. there's so much to learn. You can feel, uh, you know, overwhelmed by it all. I would say that's yeah. for learners. Yeah, and I, that's a great point. And, you know, one of the, um, when we talk about assessment for learning, one of the strategies that people recommend is focusing your lessons or your instruction like on one or a small amount of targets at a time, because it can be overwhelming to have this giant goal that seems impossible and it can help students and, and us feel a sense of accomplishment as as smaller, you know, more manageable targets are achieved on the way to that goal. Um, so excellent point. Janet, were you gonna say something? I was, I'm not sure it, it, it's sort of a chicken egg kind of situation where I'm thinking of my first class that I taught for a new class this week and sort of reviewed what I thought the targets were, but also sort of stopping along the way and saying, if this isn't what you want, not to say like get off, like this is not the train to Boston, it's the train to Pawtucket, but to say, how can we negotiate that? How can we, so it's, it's iterative. It doesn't just, I mean, and I say that as somebody who has a relative degree of, of independence um, because one of the classes I teach is not held hostage by classes as far as I know. But <laughs> uh, so sort of navigating all those paths, but also if it's if it's to be effective, and I would I would argue all the time, and then I'll shut up. But I would argue all the time you can always sort of work your way backward to whatever outcome you need in the standardized thing. But you have no hope of getting there if people aren't in agreement about why they're there in the first place. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, excellent points, and and it's nice, like you said, sometimes you're in a situation where you have some flexibility, you know, with what the targets can be. Um, Sometimes you, you don't, I mean, in terms of what the official targets are, but you need to kind of go back and find out where, where students are, where, where do you begin, and how, how, can, how can you aim you know, the targets so that it does match their interests and um, engages them. Is there anybody else? Yes, uh, well, th that's where uh, learners do come to a class with their own targets. And these targets could vary from one student to another. So uh, it, to address their targets, it, it, you know, a teacher needs to do the first assessment, okay? Then the, the teacher would know where their level is regarding that target, okay? but we have different targets in different classrooms. I have classrooms where students tell me, oh, I need to learn, you know, I need to improve my uh, oral, you know, communication. And here's another one tells me, I need to improve my, you know, written, uh, you know, language and all. So what, what, what would I do here? I try to combine both or all targets together and mix them together uh, to get them where they want to be. But I have to set the target. And when I set the target, I will let my learners know here, that's what we are going to learn. And, you know, by them being aware, they can see how it will lead them to where they ultimately want to go. Yes. Mm -hmm. yes. And I think that you all, you, know, you, you mentioned 
anything that I would want to say about, you know, benefits of clear targets for us as teachers, it's so we know what to teach and what and how to assess. I mean, if you don't know your targets, you, how do you know how to assess or what to assess? It help us plan while well, planning your instructional activities is just about the same as knowing what to teach. Also knowing the targets um, helps us interpret the results of the assessments and use them to help students or guide them. And it can also be very useful um, to have clear targets when we're having conversations with, with other colleagues, you know, maybe people who teach the next level up, you know, more advanced from us or the level before, if we have a common language or a base in terms of targets, it can help us plan, not just within a classroom, but, you know, within a whole um, school or whole program. And um, you certainly mentioned that for your learners, the target should be clear so they can understand what they're expected to learn or maybe what they want to learn. So again, it's kind of parallel to teachers interpreting and using assessment. If they're going to act on any feedback you give them in assessment or understand it, they need to know what the target was to, the, to begin with um, so that they can evaluate themselves, they can set goals, they can reflect on their progress, share their progress with others and, and, and keep going in, in their own process. Hey, hey, Susan, Susan yeah. I'm just going to add, you had a couple of comments in the chat, I think. Oh, all right. Uh, so I don't know if you can see the chat because sometimes this gets confusing, but I oh. wanted to point them out. <laughs> oh, thank you. All right. So um, I see Donna said the target is an end goal, but there are foundational goals. Yeah, many targets that are required first, especially in math. Uh, yeah, and I would agree with you, Donna. Um, we, we have that ultimate and fancy goal sometimes, but there are so many targets that lead up to it. And we're gonna spend some time um, today, I call it deconstructing our targets. Um, you can call it what you want, but identifying those mini targets. And Carrie said, it's also a structure and models goal setting. Carrie, um, okay. Can you tell me a little bit about that, Carrie? Well, if you're, if, if it's like somebody has a big goal, right? Like they want to like buy a house, uh -huh. okay? Then you have to break that big goal up into smaller ones that are even if, even like remotely achievable. Otherwise you're not gonna be able to do it because you're mimicking pretty much what everybody else has said. Yeah, yeah, okay. I Models an idea of having a bigger goal and having smaller steps along the way. Yep, that's, yeah, I agree completely. Yeah, thank you very much. I, I, oops, can I chime in? Yeah. Um, in the past, I mean, um, it's, I think that like, based on what Sabine said, it gets a little overwhelming sometimes. We as teachers assess our, our, our students, but then the students don't really understand the information and what we're assessing and what, you know, especially if you're working with a beginner level, um, you know, it's, you have to kind of like, baby everything down for them like this is what we've learned this is where we're headed so in terms of that we started using um a year or two ago we started not a year because it was pandemic a couple years back portfolios really hard to manage portfolios in an adult education class mm -hmm. uh, multi-level in ell classroom but it did bring a lot of ease and it gave the students something tangible to look at and see their progress actually in a portfolio. And I think it did help with the, you know, with encouraging the students to, to continue their, their, their studies. It, you just saw that it did bring a little bit of light to their learning um, when they could reflect back on a portfolio, see where they started, see some of their assignments, their work, the end included their assessment. And, you know, the teachers would reflect on these portfolios one-on-one -on -one, and there are discussions where students felt value. They felt like, oh, wow, she's really looking at my, my material and she's breaking this down to me where I kind of missed my, um, you know, missed some language or whatever it be. But it just gave the students something that they felt like the teacher's really paying attention. <laughs> yeah. And that sounds like an excellent example of assessment for learning. I mean, it incorporates kind of everything we want, a lot of student involvement. You know, they weren't passive recipients of, you know, of assessment or of grades or anything. Um, I assume, I'm assuming they probably assembled, you know, these portfolios. So they had to kind of analyze their own work. 
they um we didn't have a real good structure of how to do it we just kind of dived into this portfolio yeah. thing because it was something that we wanted to adopt and that carrie was part of our team at the time okay. and you know so we didn't really have a good idea of how we were going to implement portfolios but we just started doing it off the common core standards mm -hmm. and the assessment it wasn't you know um really you know well put together however it was still something that we started that we saw would work if we kind of really gave it much thought and kind of held the teachers accountable to kind of work through a portfolio um it sounds like it worked and what what ex what concrete evidence to be able to see an example of your work you know at the beginning of a, a year or something and, and then compare it at the uh, later it might not the, be. the hard thing about that was the teachers including myself, weren't, weren't sure how to structure this portfolio based on assessments. You know, like you said, some people, you know, what is an assessment? What do you consider a legit assessment, you know? Yeah. Um, so yeah. going forward, that's something that we would love to, to have ready for the teachers instead of saying, here, you're gonna build yeah. this portfolio and then you're gonna figure out your own assessments and then you're gonna figure out where your students are. And then you're gonna look at their work and you're gonna give them the feedback and you're gonna give me all the standards. It was just a lot to kind yeah. of just throw at a teacher. That, that, that's true. And I think, yeah, it's important to think of the structure. I mean, I remember when my uh, son was in kindergarten, he never brought any work home from school, you know? And I was like, oh, you know, can we, are you, you have anything you did? Oh, he's I like, said no. the same thing last it's night. Like, to no. my he's like, no, it's in my portfolio. And I'm like, okay. And I, I found out every piece of work from the whole year was in this portfolio. So the portfolio was this big, but there was no, um, there was no process for selecting or, you know, so you, you've got to think of like, what do we put in or what, yeah, what goes in? You know, so that, no, that's a great idea for something to, to kind of work, work on. Thank you. Maybe you can share what, what should be in an assessment <laughs> oh, portfolio. A, what do you include in a, you know, what's really, really important to have in there. Um, because again, we're not trained. Um, well, not everybody, but some of us aren't trained in assessments and we're trained in teaching, but not necessarily assessment. Right. Mm -hmm. Well, Joan, maybe we could uh, talk about that sometime in, in the future. I mean, at some just quickly, like some of the programs I've worked in the assessment, I mean, the portfolios were, were um, organized around standards and or learning targets and students would sometimes they would pick their best work. Like, you know, so it might be their kind of a showcase portfolio to put in. Sometimes they would, um, it would be more a progress portfolio where they would, around a particular standard or skill, show their growth. What is it? Um, you know, so there are different ways. Showcase, showcase and progress are the, the two types that people talk about usually. And usually we, there would be at a reflection piece where um, the, the learners would, kind of maybe for a standard write, write or, or speak, depending on where they are, like a little reflection on like, this is what I've learned. This is how far I've come or, you know, something like that. But um, there are different ways to, to structure that. So it sounds like good work though. Okay. Um, one thing that I wanted to also talk about in terms of targets, um, the way I like to categorize learning targets is, as you can see on the screen. Um, some people, sometimes people use Bloom's portfolio. I mean, Bloom's portfolio, Bloom's <laughs> taxonomy, which is kind of similar to this, you know, way of organizing and classifying what students are learning to, to um, do or what they're learning to understand. I find this kind of more simple. Um, I like to think of the, my targets for students as being knowledge targets, or reasoning targets, skill, product, or disposition targets. And I'll talk about each of these in, um, in just a second. But, you know, uh, knowledge targets are, you know, factual information we want our students to learn or remember, or maybe procedural knowledge, knowing how to do something without having to act it out or, you know, perform it physically, or concepts for them to understand. And they form, um, knowledge targets form the foundation of every other type of target that we ever, we have for our students. And so, um, you know, when you see verbs in standards, oops, sorry, or in um, statements, you know, of, of learning targets that, where they talk about know or list or recall or remember or know how to or understand, 
um, those are learning targets. And, and we, we all have or always have knowledge targets for our students. They form the basis for them being able to analyze or um, create or produce something or, or do something more advanced. And more, you know, a little bit more complex than the knowledge targets are reasoning targets. And we, you know, we want students to know things, but not just be able to regurgitate or spit back facts. Um, we want them to apply their knowledge and to, to use their knowledge in different reasoning processes. So, um, you know, when we want our students to predict or infer, classify, hypothesize, I won't read this, read this whole list, the, those are reasoning targets. And if you've ever used Bloom's taxonomy of learning objectives, Bloom has a number of different levels that, that encompass all of the, our reasoning targets. On the other hand, we also have um, skill targets for our students, and those are those are targets where like a real and actual demonstration or physical performance is at the heart of learning. It's what students need to be able to do. And, you know, skill targets are very common in ESOL. A lot of you teach, you know, ESOL that they need to be able to hold a conversation or speak clearly um, so that others can understand or go to the store and, buy something and use English to, to do that. Performing arts, you know, dancing or acting, things like that have a lot of skill targets. Workplace education too, maybe students need to be able to um, perform certain tasks in the workplace. And, and in some of the more traditional subjects, just being able to, to read out loud or read out, you know, have oral fluency, give a presentation. Those are um, skill targets as well. And we also um, have product targets where students have to create something. Um, they create a product, they create a project. And the way we assess them is, you know, we specify what the qualities of a good product are. And that's what we teach to and what hopefully students learn and what we end up assessing when we have that product in front of us. And so some product, um, you know, examples um, or targets that we have for our students, we maybe want them to create tables and graphs or produce a report or draft a personal wellness plan, write a resume, a cover letter, maybe uh, develop some artistic work, you know, create a vase or draw, or paint a picture. But here, you know, what we're, um, what we want them to be able to do is produce something. And then finally, and often overlooked um, our disposition targets. And those are, you know, attitudes, dispositions, attitudes, motivations, interests that affect um, learners' approaches to or maybe willingness to learn. And they, they support and strengthen um, our students' learning. And so some examples of dispositions that we want or we hope our students develop are perseverance, you know, when things get tough, patience with the learning process, maybe reflection on their own learning, openness to new ideas. And um, so it's important to think of, you know, what type of target you have for um, student learning. And not in next week, we're gonna talk about more designing assessments, but it's really, it's crucial to be clear about the target type to be sure that you um, are matching it with the right kind of assessment. And so I, um, I have here, I hope you can see these clearly. We have 12 different um, learning targets. These might be um, learning targets some of you use in your own instruction or ones that you might recognize. And um, I'd like you to take some time to categorize them. You know, are these, is each one knowledge, reasoning, skill, product, or disposition? And I'm going to do two things. First of all, just in case it is, um, it would be useful for you. I'm going to send in the chat um, a copy of what you see on the screen in a Word file, just in case you want to open it up and um, look at it that way or, you know, maybe even check um, 
put your answers there. Let me, okay, so I have, oh, it says network disconnect. It's not <laughs> letting me put it in. That's so strange. I'm gonna try again and I will keep trying. <laughs> Very weird. Um, I'll figure out some other way if, um, and hopefully you can still see what's on the, actually what I'm going to do, I think instead is just to cut and paste them into the chat. Because the reason I'm saying this is that I'm going to break you into small groups and ask you to go through these 12 learning targets and, and categorize them and, and we'll talk about it after. Um, and see if we all agree. So I'm sorry. Let me. Okay. All right. So they're uh, in the chat. I'll keep trying to um, chat oh. on that document, but I don't know why. <laughs> All right, so so the task for you in the next few minutes is to um, look at these different learning targets and then classify them. Um, knowledge, reasoning, skill, product, or disposition. And I thought I would um, put you into groups of two, if you don't mind. Um, give you five minutes or so to kind of come to agreement on those and then we will come back together. So how many people do we have? We have 12. I'm going to put you in. Um, Joan, do you want to be in a room? I'll put you in five rooms and then I'll come in. I'll come see how everybody's doing as well. Is, is that clear? Okay, thank you. Yeah. Yeah, I was gonna say, don't put me in a room, but I can bop through and make sure people can figure out what yeah. they're doing. And if you, and you will probably be in a room when I when I actually create the rooms, and then I can take you out. Oh, so okay, that, I don't that's fine. So, so that I just leave one person. Yeah, okay. and I'm also I'm also by the way taking this and trying to put it into a Google Doc that I can just easily share because sometimes oh, I can easily. I did that, Joan, if you want it. I'll do that. Everything sure. else I have for you today is in a in, is in Google Docs, so I can do either. Well, t I'll put you in your groups, and then we'll figure it out. Okay. So I'll see you in like five minutes or so. It's three o two. And Joan, you're not in any room, which is good. Yeah, that's good because then I can oh, bop into a maybe room. because you're a presenter. Yeah, um, I've had that happen, which is which is fine. Okay. So. Um, I can put want me to put that on um, in a Google Doc. Yeah, I started to do it, but if you want it, you might be able to just do a quick okay, one. Okay, I'm, I'm going to. And then if you put the link in the chat, they yeah. may or may not get it. If sometimes you yeah, only get the chat based on what room you're in, but that's okay if, if it's in there i should have it right and i can share it in other words yeah um let me do that now i should have done that to begin with because i i have a few google docs that i'm going to share with people um but that one i didn't okay and i'll let you monitor the five minutes because <laughs> yeah okay and i'm going to share it um one second Okay, let me do it in the chat now. Okay. okay, I got it. <clears throat> I'm gonna go into, I'm gonna go into room two, just so you know. Okay. Um... But I have the doc, so I can just share that with somebody. Again. Yeah, and I will also, because you can share a message with the breakout oh, room. Oh, right, you can. I, I always forget that. to I'm do gonna that. I'm going to send that also in. Um, a okay. Message. Yeah, all right, so, okay.
Hello. Hi. Yeah, I just went in one room. They couldn't remember what the categories were <laughs> in the one room I went into. Not surprising. So All right. I'll bop through. I, I can send that to in the, the chat. I'm going to do that. Yeah. Let's see. I'll bop through a couple of rooms. Okay. Yeah. So I went to term did I went go to? I went to a couple also. Oh, you did? Okay. Who didn't you go to, just so I know? Oh, well, actually, let me, um, because right now I'm looking at that class, the, um, let me just send them the, what the categories are okay. so in case they need it. Sorry. Now let me look at the breaker. I went in two, one. I went in two, three. Yeah, that's where I went into. Okay, so I went into five, so I'll just bop into two. Okay, and I can go into four as well. Okay. I think I'm going to bring everybody back. No, they just, one group was just more or less started, but anyway. Oh, they were just starting? Well, we could do it together, you yeah. know. Yeah, we can always do it together. What I always tell people with this chart, Susan, is don't overthink it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, especially with the writing things, I find, because the assessment method is going to be the same. Um, you know, so sometimes it, it's not so important. Is, is it a product? Is it a skill? But it's right. And isn't it both? Well, what do you really, you're right. Yeah. yeah. I've, I've been in those debates more than once. So I, uh, my usual advice is when you look at this, don't overthink it. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I will, I will not argue, Joan. Yes. <laughs> yeah. and it's fun to argue with Joan though. <laughs> <laughs> yep. <laughs> Not like you've done that before, Jane. <laughs> maybe, maybe. I don't know. Just once. <laughs> Never. Everybody should be. Back. All right, whatever. <laughs> All right, we're back. Everybody's back, or I think everybody's back. Okay. Sorry. Um, I know that some of you could see the the target some you could some couldn't um so can you see what i have on the screen i have a oh can yes. you see can yeah. you see yes. my learning target? okay so let's maybe we can just uh do this together and i can i can fill this out and you tell me what you thought and we can talk about it oh. um so what what if you what do you say about this first one work through struggles and recognize the that the frustration of the moment will yield rewards. Anybody want to? D. Uh, what? What did you say? D. The C. Position. Yeah. Anybody disagree? I thought skill. Mm -hmm. Why? Tell me about. Uh, oh, oh, you're you maybe were muted. Yeah, this no disposition, disposition. Okay, yeah. all right, okay, yeah. It's kind of an, I mean, and here we're really thinking of an attitude, you know, that the, if the person's willing to do this, maybe actually being able to work through skills struggles could be kind of a skill as well. Mm -hmm. How about express themselves orally in English? What did you say there? It's a skill. 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 Yeah. skill. Uh, you? Um, develop a model based on evidence. Product. 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 Oh. Oh, product. Does everybody say product? Yeah. yeah. All right. 
How about assess how point of view or purpose shapes content and style of a text? So I said reasoning. And who is speaking? I can't uh, see. I completely agree with you, but I, I want to. Oh, it's Jane. Oh, okay, Jane. Yeah. Yeah, because here you're you're using some knowledge and you're, you know, kind of doing some processing in your mind. Um, so I agree with your reasoning. How about describe Earth's place in the universe? That's knowledge. Knowledge. Um, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and if anybody disagrees or has questions, please, you know, uh, feel free to just speak out. Um, be willing to entertain new and challenging ideas and stay with them. Disposition. 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 <laughs> yes. Yeah. That sure helps learning, huh? Um, adapt your speech to a variety of contexts and communicative tasks. That skill? Skill. Skill. I would say, I would agree in that. Make sure I'm in the right column. Yeah. And um, we we're talking about this a little bit in um, one of the rooms that I went into, that according to kind of the framework we're using here today, a skill is something that you can physically observe a person doing. And this is a perfect example, a person speaking and adapting their speech, you know, depending on the task. Um, and so if you can see them do it, it's a skill. Um, how about evaluate a speaker's point of view, reasoning and use of evidence and rhetoric? Reasoning. I agree with, I'm not sure who said that, but yeah. I agree. If anybody disagrees, let me know. You know I don't disagree necessarily, but I'm just a little confused about the nuance between a skill and reasoning, like because that's directly from the career and college readiness standards. I, I recognize the... I, I think they I all know. are, or, or so, some degree. I don't know if they, I don't know if they, if they absolutely, well, maybe they, maybe they all are, and I just don't know all of them as well, like some of them I know better. Yeah. So, um, I want to know what the difference, though, is between, well, what's the, is the skill, I understand you can be able to observe it, but I could, I could also be able to observe that. A person being able to do that. You, so, I, I mean, I'm not saying that it's not yeah. reasonable, I'm just not sure well, how those two things are being Well. I mean, the, when a person's evaluating like a point of view, that's something, it's a reasoning process. They're able, you know, they're able to evaluate it. They might speak it and you might be able to observe them doing it, but then the observation is how you're assessing it. Okay. That would be the method of assessment is the person has to say it out loud or present or something. But what, what, what the- So if it's internal, if it's an internal situation, then it's more of yeah. a reasoning situation. If yeah. it's an external situation, it's- yeah. Mm -hmm. um, right. Yeah, that's good. Yeah, mm -hmm. thank and, that's, and thank you for bringing that up because sometimes when we when we go a, little, a step further where we're like really breaking these down, people will include like how you assess it, and I'll say, well, that's not necessarily part of the target, but it's the way we would assess it or know if the person can do it. So thank you for that. How about recognize and understand contractions of B? Knowledge. Knowledge, knowledge, knowledge. Yeah, yeah. Because mm -hmm. here it's really just understanding. Gather relevant information from multiple print and digital sources. And That's a skill. Yeah. Product. Um, how about write narratives to develop product? Product. Product. Yeah, I said product. Somebody else said it's a skill to be able to do it, but. Well, you know, in this, Joan was saying before you. Um, before you got back, you know, she said her advice when people are, are uh, working on this is don't overthink it. And I often, um, I will have discussions with people, I'm trying to, uh, to shade this and I'm not working, where people say, oh my gosh, that's a skill to be able to write an error, but it's a skill. And some people say it's a product. And some of this really depends on your intent. You know, if, if you as the, the teacher if, you're, if your focus is on that product that comes out of this process, you could call it a product. If though you're more, um, you're more focused on the, the writing and the, 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 the writing process, it might be a skill. And so I'm not gonna you know, split hairs in this case. And one of the reasons why sometimes it really doesn't matter is because the whole reason we're talking about this is because of assessment. And the, your method of assessing this would be the same, whether you, whether you like really think it's got to be a product or you really think it's a skill. 
the method of assessment is looking at that narrative and, and evaluating it. So, um, oh, I, I changed my, so generally I would, for this one, I would say, um, I'm making a mess of this. I would say a product, but if you really were intent on it being a skill, it certainly could be argued. Now, what about this last one? Understand decimal notation for fractions and compare decimal fractions. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I said if you need that knowledge to be able knowledge, to- Knowledge, yeah. So you could look at it a variety of ways, but yeah. And, and honestly, I, I, I included it on purpose because it's a perfect example of the way a lot of our standards and targets and things are written, where really it's, it's double barreled. It's really two, you know, because this really should be two separate targets um, because you've got the understanding and you've got the, which is um, understand decimal notation and you have the comparing, which is, well, um, reasoning. Well, which yeah, it I would say I would say reasoning, reasoning, um, yeah. because it, it they're comparing it. It that's kind of a, a that's a mental process. How you would you would um, assess it is maybe have them do it in front of you, or maybe they would do it on a, on a worksheet. There would be something you could actually see. But comparing decimal fractions is um, it's a it's a process of analysis and comparison and you know things like that, um, but lots of times our standards and things are are really heavy and loaded and and kind of complicated. So you you did a, a you did a great job um, of this. I you uh, you um, had a lot of less disagreement than I sometimes see. So I can see why a lot of you said you were. Um, really strong at assessment. And I want to share something with you now and ask you to, so I'm curious about targets in your own, um, in your own content areas and I'm trying to find, I'm going to share a link with you in the chat. It's a Google doc that you can all go to, and then I'm going to share my screen so we can look at it at the same time. And I thought just be interesting to see some of the this the learning targets that you that you teach to or that you use in your um, own. Um, classes, you know, what are some examples of knowledge of different kinds of targets in your area? And you can just type on here and we'll be able to see it's all anonymous and you don't have to fill out one for each, but I thought it'd be interesting to see, you know, where your own work aligns with this. You could even think of one, you know, in your area. Yeah, patience. I see somebody uh, wrote having patience with how long it takes to learn a language. Yeah, that's pretty, that's definitely important. I'm not typing anything, but I would just add that, you know, teaching GD, basically, um, they make it pretty simple for us because they have official study <laughs> that outline exactly what the knowledge is that's needed, what reasoning skills are required and what the skill is for every subject. So, I mean, that's basically in my world right now, teaching the four subjects for GED. Right. We just use that as a basic template, mm -hmm. work from there. So you don't have to be too about it. Great, yeah, so they're broken down for you. And then how about in terms of assessment? Do they provide you the assessments or then do you have to kind of build or? Yeah, they, they have a practice test for 10 questions. They have a ready, GED ready, half the test time, half the test questions, and then an official test. Students have to score 145, which is the minimum. And so it's pretty spelled out. That's the assessment. Mm -hmm. There's no two ways around it. So. 
But you know, the, that's really the summative assessment. I mean, that's really the, you know, the end product. I think that we have to do- The formative assessment is class. It's every day we're asking, what do yeah. you know how to do? Do you know how to do this skill? Do you yeah. need to work on this? I, I mean, think that there, um, through the, um, you know, through the pro, like, I think you can scaffold that right. to get to the end result, but you can assess at each part of the Absolutely, scaffold. absolutely. Yeah. Well, it'll be interesting next week um, to talk about like- Oh yeah, we're assessing every single day as soon as we open our mouths. Right, yeah. Uh, um, it'll be, the ones that are given to you, it'll be interesting too to look next week at whether the assessments that are provided are appropriate for all the learning targets, um, because we'll talk about that and talk about some ways to, you know, to do that formative assessment as well. So I see somebody said identified parts of the body. That's definitely a learning target. Um, and then here I got what statements should a patient make and what statements should a doctor make? And um, for whoever wrote this, what's, what kind of reasoning is the student having to do with regard to these patients with the statements? Well, um, the, there is a list of statements and uh, made commonly by patients or commonly by doctors and they'd have to do a comparison Okay. Uh, an evaluation. Oh, okay. Yeah. So maybe like compare or evaluate. Yeah. So I was just wondering like what oh, okay. exactly yes. is the reasoning. Okay, yeah. great. That's better. Um, mm -hmm. And then I, that sounds like probably these two are similar. So that's, that's great. Now here I see under skill, be able to identify mistakes. I think that's a great thing for people to do. My question for you is according to kind of the way we're classifying things, would that be a skill or would that be reasoning? Hmm. Reasoning. That should be reasoning. Yeah, I would say it really, it, it really, um, you know, and again, we're using a certain like taxonomy, a certain uh, cl classification system, but I would really, I would really say that would go up in reasoning because it's it's a, to be able to identify mistakes. Some but they people have to maybe analyze um, their work or analyze something or evaluate something. So I would really put it up there in reasoning. Um, be able to reverse engineer a problem. That's interesting. What does that mean? Like, well, like for example, when we um, whenever we give like assignments like math assignments if they're working on something for example I always try to include the answers because first of all I might not be available to give mm -hmm. them the answer or talk to them through it but they need to be able to look at the answer and determine how did they get how did that person get to that answer mm -hmm. they need to be able to reverse engineer it and I think that's a pretty good skill overall it's it, for me that's completely a skill maybe it takes some reasoning effort but mm -hmm. being able to do it is definitely something that you have to repeat and repeat and repeat mm -hmm. Yeah, I would, you know, I, I would probably call it reasoning. Um, but, you know, some people might say that's a reasoning skill, you know, so I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna split hairs, but um, I think it's, you know, to be able to reverse, to be able to look at the answer and figure out, um, I don't know, whatever you said, the question or whatever. The, the steps to get to, yeah. like, you have to figure yeah. out the steps that somebody got there. Like, if you didn't get the answer correct, then how did, how did they get to that yeah. answer? Mm -hmm. And so I would say there's a lot of evaluation and analysis going on there. So, um, so I, I would probably, you know, really for these two, um, I'm probably, I would probably call these more re reasoning to tell you the truth for those, oops, to, for those two. Now, somebody here said break into groups and develop a plan. Yep, okay. And I would say the developing a plan would be the product learning target. The breaking up into groups would be, you know, kind of part of the, the, the activity, but developing yes. a plan, yes. yeah. Yes, right. And then we've got patience and grit. Yeah, that's very important too. Okay, so I can see how this really, what this looks like in your own um, situations. I, I, the only thing I would call attention to, you know, the, is the, what we have here in the skills. Um, as long as you're, you know, assessing it correctly, I, I'm not worried about it, but I really feel like those two examples are reasoning, um, reasoning processes the students have to master more than something they have to physically perform, but that's, that's the 
kind of the, the categorization schema. And could you give us an example then of what you would define as a skill, like, like I, maybe like a drills? Is that what you're talking? Like maybe yeah. like they have to like do a hundred uh, percentage to decimal, just as an okay. example. Measure length with a ruler. Um, you know, use lab equipment correctly or something like that, or um, use the past tense. Like use a dictionary? Come, yeah, yeah, use past tense and kind of use a dictionary. Warm pencil. Um, do the, the two-step <laughs> or something like that, you know. Um, um, aim a, uh, you know, and this is stupid. It, it, like I'm thinking of sports kinds of things, things like that, that you can, that naturally are things you would, you could observe a person physically demonstrating, you know? Yeah, so that's just the way I'm thinking about it. Can I throw a question out there too? Yeah. Mm -hmm. I'm thinking like some folks are in workplace programs, right? So they're probably observing people, um, I don't know, taking blood pressures or working mm -hmm. with patients yeah. and all those, those are all fall under skill, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, I agree. Okay. Mm -hmm. okay. Okay. You know, I'm gonna give you a break right now. Um, how about five minutes? Joan said five minutes is fine for you all. So um, how about it's 329, I'll see you at 334. Okay. Is that okay? All right, thank you, see you soon. Again, to put your seatbelt on or actually sit down. 
we're gonna have a problem, okay? I, I, don't want, I don't want you to be on that bus standing up or yelling. Joan, any big plans for tomorrow? Um, big, yeah, actually, well, you know, I'm, I'm in Colorado, right? So, oh, okay. <laughs> yeah. That's good. So I'm out here and yeah, I think we're going to the mountains tomorrow. Hmm. So that's, that's the plan. It's, it has, yeah, we've had some colder weather, rainier weather, but uh, tomorrow's supposed to, it's getting nicer every day. <laughs> well, good, good. That's well, happy, tomorrow. Happy birthday. Thank oh, you. Oh, happy, happy birthday. birthday. Yeah. Oh. Tomorrow. Yes. Tomorrow's the day. Tomorrow for Joan. <laughs> oh, well. Okay. That's great. Well, I think we should begin um, because it, it's all, you know, getting close to time to finish, actually. Um, and one question I wanted to ask you next, but I think you've already answered it is, you know, what are some diff you know, differences between a standard and a learning target? And you've all made clear, you know, the fact that you have these goals or targets, and it might be this standard that has been established, but you have lots of targets that lead up to it. So that's really just something I wanted to um, kind of highlight. And sometimes when I'm talking about with people about how to like break down a standard or a bigger target, a bigger, big target into smaller ones, I use something like that's kind of real, um, at least for some of you, not for me, but like golf, you know, so say the standard was at the level of, you know, the student must demonstrate an excellent golf swing. If you're going to teach that, or you're going to and going to assess it as a teacher, you don't just start with the excellent golf swing. You have to break it down into its essential pieces. And you know where this demonstrated excellent golf swing is a skill because it's something you know somebody physically would perform. You can observe it, but if you're going to teach it and assess their prog the student's progress along the way, that person needs some knowledge, like understanding the concept of swing dynamic. They need to be able to do some reasoning, um, evaluate whether the right forearm is parallel to the spine and things like that. So there's some mental processes that take place and then some skills that underlie the overall skill of, of do, having an excellent golf swing, like maintaining proper placement of the feet, gripping the club properly, performing the three parts of a swing. Um, so this is an example of a larger target broken down into its essential pieces for like teaching and assessment. And so, you know, one of the things I wanted to, you know, bring up is that we have to deconstruct our standards or deconstruct our um, targets into their underlying more manageable learning targets. And you have brought that up um, in our conversation so that they're clear for all of us. Um, and, you know, sometimes you have to do this deconstruction, sometimes you don't. So like some standards or targets are really clear and simple, like capitalized words and titles. You can't, I mean, that's pretty simple, but then some standards are, are quite heavy and complicated. And the, the one here below that's three, five lines is an example of 
uh, target that we have that you're really going to need to break down if you're going to teach and assess it. And so, you know, what the process that I recommend for deconstructing them is first determine the ultimate target type, you know, and uh, the ultimate type in a standard or in a, a goal is a product for this is, you know, a, um, the ultimate, if there's a product in the standard, it's a product standard. If there's, um, if there's a skill in the standard, but no product, it's a skill. Um, so here going from left to right, knowledge is like less than reasoning, which is less than skill, which is less than product, only in terms of deconstruction. I'm not saying products are, are more rigorous or more sophisticated. Uh, but then you want to identify the prerequisite or underlying knowledge, reasoning, skills, or products, and of course check, you know, to see if you're um, accurate. And so, you know, usually when I'm working with groups before we deconstruct a standard that is in our own disciplines, I start with something that most of us are familiar with, um, and that it is, you know, like driving a car. And so, if you say you were maybe a driving teacher. Um, but if this was your, the standard that you wanted your students to be able to learn and, you know, and, and, and show evidence of, drive a car skillfully and safely. I'm going to ask you to deconstruct the standard. So this is the, you know, the, the end goal is driving that car. So what knowledge do they need, students need? What patterns of reasoning will they have to master? What skills are required, if any? And what products do they have to um, develop or be able to develop, if any? And so I have a, um, a template or, um, available for you to work with online. And I'm going to send you a link right now. I sent you the link. And I'm going to share my screen so that we can all see the same thing. But um, can you see the this template I have for deconstructing a yes. standard? Yes. So first of all, like oh, just what's the what overarching type is this target? Drive a kill skip, try drive a car skillfully and safely. Is that knowledge? Is that reasoning, skill, or product? Anybody can answer. Yeah, I, I would agree that that is a, a skill. Yeah. I mean, it's something a person physically has to demonstrate or perform um, that driving. And so, you know, if you were teaching someone to drive um, and assessing whether they have mastered the, the, the skill and the underlying targets on the way to it, what, how would you deconstruct this? Like what, if you look here, what knowledge do st students need to, um, to master to be able to drive a car skillfully? They'd have to know the parts of the car, like know yeah. what the brake is and what yeah. the steering wheel is. Okay, yeah. So uh, I'm gonna just say no parts of the car. Somebody wrote, no, I think it would be know how a car works. Um, and so you can just go at it if you, if you want, you know, what kind of reasoning would they have to master? What, <laughs> what, no, which... I'm only laughing. I have a, a, a daughter with a permit at the moment. So I'm laughing. <laughs> okay. Well then this may be much more uh, relevant or recent to you, you know, than for, for others, you know, which pedals do what? Yeah, exactly. So certainly there's under there's knowledge, understand the meaning of road signs, exactly. Thank you. What kind of reasoning? And so somebody, the anonymous pumpkin or somebody wrote, they'll need to understand other drivers' patterns. And so when they do that, anonymous dragon, um, what what will they need to do? What do you mean by that? like understanding those patterns? I don't know. Okay. 
Um, so somebody wrote making decisions on when to break. That's kind of a, a process of evaluation, I would think, or maybe analyzing the situation. Or you have your mother in the car who says, hit the brake. <laughs> yeah. And then then it's that? a skill if they can do it. That's a skill to actually be then able it's a to skill. do what your yeah. mother says, right? <laughs> okay. Yeah. Um, so in terms of understanding other drivers' expected patterns, you know, I'm wondering here, is that like they'll have to evaluate these as they're driving or would they need to understand in general, what driver's patterns are, which would be a knowledge target. Does anybody want to explain what they were th ooh, thinking there? I don't, I don't know. So um, if this is, you know, if this is like driving and seeing how people are driving and assessing those patterns and then making decisions, I'd say, yeah, it's reasoning. If it's just understanding there are some drivers that drive this way and others who drive other ways. Yeah, I think it's like, you know, you have to like, even though I might be taking a right, I have to check over my right because people yeah. pass on the right. Yeah. So yeah. I need to be able to like understand that there are expected things, especially in particular cultures where people don't pay attention to the knowledge base, but you have to be able to analyze what's happening in your environment. Yeah, okay, I agree with you completely. And somebody wrote, make judgments on speed and slowing down. That's per, that's a good example of reasoning. Assessing road conditions, that's a great example of reasoning. Skills that you need, you need to be able to parallel park, merge onto the highway, use your controls, change lanes safely. Those are great examples of, of skills that underlie this larger um, target. Let's look what at what people put in the product column. Somebody said plan a trip and get the car successfully from A to B. Yeah, that's what I'm trying I, to I guess say it's the B. same thing. Yeah. Yeah. What do, um, and so are you thinking that there would be a product, some kind of plan developed? Um, I'm not sure. Well, I guess that, I mean, the, the, I mean, maybe it would be a skill. I don't know, like the, but the, when it's, yeah, it seems like that's like slightly more substantial than just like a skill. Mm -hmm. I don't know. Well, and, and, you know, prior to GPS where you just plugged your phone in and, and went, you'd have to like map out your trip and how, what roads do you, you know, show me the road, like, the old triptych. None of you are old enough for that, but oh, I am. <laughs> I'm old um, enough. And see, that's that's what I have a question about that because yes, being able to plan a trip is, I mean, it's necessary if you're going to make a trip. Um, I question whether planning a trip from A to B is necessary to drive skillfully and safely. Um, um, well, I want to know you're going to get there and not end up in. Mm -hmm. you know the wrong part of town or the wrong yeah, what's uh, the point of getting in the car if you don't know where you're going well I mean, I, that's that's my my because some people do drive for fun no I do <laughs> well you know in that case Beatrice I would put it under skill right okay because because the the aim of driving a car skillfully and safely is not that you have a, a written that you you make this plan you 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 create something that we can see, it's that you're able to do it. Um, so I would actually move that over to the skills column. I don't know if I can, I can try. I, well, I might be able, uh, let's see. <laughs> I might be able to. Um, I'm gonna just cut and paste. Um, okay, map out your trip. That's like the same thing. So I'm gonna put that over to the skills too. And then let's if you stop. drew a map, though, wouldn't that be if you like drew a map, if you drew a map, that would be a product, but I don't think it would be a product for this um, for this standard. Hmm. You know, I think it would be a different standard to be able to draw out a map like navigate. Yeah, show yeah. Your nav yeah, yeah. Now, if this I, I have we've got two of almost the same thing here, pass the test and pass the written road test. And sometimes people will put, you know, have a license or something like that. Now, do you have to do these things in order to um, 
in order to be able to, to drive a car skillfully and safely. Like I, I may know how to drive skillfully and safely and I may do it, it might be illegal, but. I think that's part of why my question is. Like, but if it's illegal, is it safe? Yeah, oh. like skillfully and safely are both yeah. like kind of subjective mm -hmm. terms. So like that would be very difficult. Who says? I mean, I see people driving unskillfully and unsafely all the time okay. and they have licenses. All right, good point about the safely. But you know what I would say about all three of these here? I'd say these are assessments. You know, these are what you put in the product column. Those are assessment methods. Yeah, um, but if I'm the, but if I'm the, so if I'm the mom mm -hmm. and I need to insure my 16 year old pain in the lovely mm -hmm. daughter, um, if she can prove to me that she has done X, Y, Z, then I get better insurance rates. So oh. that's a product. Her, her product is proving her skillfulness and I get better insurance rates. Well, then I would say the standard is obtain good insurance rates. Mm. I, I would change the standard in that case. You know, yeah. but, so if that's the ultimate target. Well, not for her, but for me. Yes, but I, if the target is right. can a person drive safely and skillfully, mm -hmm. These are assessments. These are ways that you would gather that evidence that you could give to the insurance company or get that license or, um, mm -hmm. you know, prove to somebody. So um, this is, you know, this is, this is great that you put this here, but these, these are really our assessment methods um, that you would use to, to get at this standard of um, being able to drive um, skillfully or safely. And the reason so I'm, I'm, oh, go ahead. So what is a product? Having gas in the car? A product, um, oh, putting gas in the car, I'd call a skill. Yeah. Um, I don't know if I would see a product related to this standard. Um, it's almost as though the product is like a, a non, you like the product is a car that's still in the same functional <laughs> condition that it was when you got in it. <laughs> There you go. Well, yeah, <laughs> maybe. Yeah, I hadn't thought of that. Having met all speed limits, I think that's an assessment too. Yeah. yeah. Uh huh. These are all assessments. Yeah. From yeah. That, all and I'll show you something that I uh, that I want to share with you. Yeah. And this, believe me, we'll get to um, connecting with assessment as we go forward. And so here. You know, I, I just wrote a few things. They're kind of like same as what you put, the knowledge, some of the reasonings, the skills. But when you have a skill, skill target, there are no underlying products. You may have them create something as an assessment, but it's not product development is not inherent in driving, you know, a car skillfully or safely. Mm -hmm. And the, well, the driver license itself is a product. The, yes, but that's the assessment of whether the person can drive skillfully and safely. Not necessarily. Why not? You see so many people on the road with a driver license, but they don't know how. I'm not saying it's a perfect assessment. We're going to talk next week about accurate assessments. Okay. So, no, I agree with you. Yeah, we see a lot of bad, bad drivers. Okay. Um, and so here, let me... Here, this is kind of, and, and there, you know, there is a, a, sorry, I don't know what's going on here. Um, there is a, I used to this, but when you're like deconstructing them, if you have a knowledge target, that's the overarching type, the only things underlying it are knowledge. If you have reasoning, a reasoning target, you need knowledge and you need to be able to perform some reasoning um, processes. If you, if the overarching target is a skill like drive a car, you need knowledge, you need some reasoning and you need skills like you talked about brake, uh, braking and steering and things like that. If you, if the overarching um, goal or target is for the, for students to produce something, to produce a report or produce a piece of pottery or um, make a, uh, a cake or something like that, then you need 
everything. If there's knowledge, there's reasoning, you know, and I, I, you know, here I put skills sometimes. Like when I read about this, people say sometimes you don't need skill to develop a product. I can't think of a single example of when you wouldn't need a skill to create a product. So I, I put here sometimes here because that's what I find in the sources that I use. But I really think I've never, I can't think of an example of a product that doesn't require some kind of skills. Um, and then of course, you know, creating the product itself. So that's why, we, you know, when we had the skill of driving the car. What about oh, accidental inventions? And tell me what you mean. Oh, huh. You wouldn't uh, need any skill. <laughs> that's, that's, that's a really good, I, I, huh, that's, that's very interesting. And next time somebody says, well, what's an example? I'm going to think of that because I wouldn't <laughs> have thought of that. Uh, very good idea. Yeah. Um, so keep, keep this in mind as, as we go forward. And I don't know if you're, you know, um, if you, I thought I would give this to you as an optional homework, or we can start with it next time. Um, but I found a, um, well, not I found, I took a standard from um, the adults um, basic education standards. And it's in an ELL can adapt language choices to purpose, task, and audience when speaking and writing. And I wanted to ask you, and if, if you wanna work on it between now and next week, fine. If not, we're gonna start with this next time. I'd like to deconstruct a real um, adult education standard together and kind of go through that process. and. So this is the um, this is the template, and I had a handout I was going to send you, but you know what? I think I'll put it on Google Docs and send you the link instead, um, because I'm not having luck with. I'll try one more time with attaching a, um, a file. Let's see if it works. Now I don't know why it says network disconnect, but I'm going to do that in the next minute or so. And I'm conscious of our time right now. Um, and so I thought I would recap a little bit, you know, just kind of what we have talked about. Um, we talked about, you know, assessment and why it's important for our teachers. We spend so much time at it for learners. It can really impact their learning, their motivation. We talked about the differences between assessment of and assessment for learning. Um, we identified those five standards of quality for assessment, which are over on the right hand of your screen. We focused on one and two, the purposes and targets. We've classified learning outcomes and we've started to unpack um, learning outcomes for, for teaching and learning. And, and next week we're gonna continue with this and really talk about for which, for different outcomes, what are the appropriate methods of assessment? What should your assessments look like and how would you use them, you know, assessment for learning? Um, and what I would like you to do, if you, if you would, is to, in the next couple of minutes, we have just a little bit of time left. Um, I often ask students to do this at the end of my sessions, is to kind of think about your learning um, today um, and think of what you used to think or understand about assessment or assessment for learning or targets or anything we talked about today, before today and then compare it to what you think or understand now. Um, you know, and I'm just interested to see if any of your understandings or um, really your understandings or our thinking on any of these topics have changed. So I'm gonna share this link with you. I need to stop sharing to do it. And sorry. So if you could be thinking about that for a second, and I'm gonna put it in the chat. And then I'm gonna share my screen so you can see what it looks like. Can you see my screen now? Yeah. 
Um, so just, you know, and this is anonymous too, you know, if, if just, I'm just curious if, you know, if today has helped you think in a different way or maybe made you think of different things. And so the example I put here is, you know, I used to think that formative assessment was only useful to teachers. Now I understand that it provides information to students too, just as a general example. Um, and I'm wondering if you could kind of think of some of the um, things we've talked about today and if you're, if it's made you think of other things or think of anything differently. And I'll give you a minute or so to do that. getting that document ready for you for next time. Just... Okay, I'm, I'm going from the bottom up. Um, and, and interesting, somebody wrote that you used to kind of focus mostly on knowledge and skills and you see the importance of assessing disposition. And I agree with whoever wrote that, you know, dispositions are um, often, you know, they're often not regarded at all, but they, they play a part in people's openness to learning or if they facilitate learning. Um, and somebody, you know, wrote that you understand I can assess differently depending on the type of target and that we're really going to talk about that next week. Um, someone wrote that you used to not explore all the target options. Um, and as you're wondering about where that disposition fits into any of this. Yeah. And in terms of the break, like the deconstructing, um, we can talk about that next week as well, because, you know, when you think of about a disposition, often there is some kind of knowledge that um, underlies it. And when we were talking before about, I mean, working through problems, I, I can see that there is some skill associated with that. So um, great, great point. Um, and somebody else wrote, they're interested in learning more about the distinction between product and skill. Mm -hmm. Okay, those are good points for next week as well. Um, so, okay, uh, Dalila, you have to go. Okay, it's 4.01. So I want to thank you for your time. I hope that today has been um, useful to you. Um, I sent you the link to that, um, the activity for next time, or if you're really feeling ambitious, you could start it ahead of time, no pressure. Mm -hmm. But I, um, I, I look forward to seeing you next time and I thank you. And next time we will um, continue with what we started today and really go into <clears throat> methods for formative and, and assessment and assessment for learning. So mm -hmm. thank you everyone. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks. <clears throat> Thanks, everyone. We'll see you next Wednesday. And yes, Happy. you'll see another link for me between now and then. Happy birthday tomorrow, Joan. Oh, yeah. Happy day. birthday, <laughs> Joan. Okay. Bye. And, uh, and Jane, too, right? Okay. <laughs> I do not. Yeah.